Once again, a very good afternoon to all and welcome to the launch of the Sing Health Center for Person-Centered Care. My name is Jie Pin, I'm a medical social worker and standing beside me is Balkis, one of our Aston Network ambassadors and will be your MCs for today. We hope this will be a cozy event where we gather to celebrate the launch of the center to promote person-centered care practices, research, education, collaboration, both regionally and internationally. We are delighted to see many of our senior leaders and colleagues here among the audience today. A very warm welcome to our group CEO, Prof. Ivy Ng, and Deputy GCEO, Prof. Lee Chen En, who will both be addressing us shortly. Our Estas, community residents, patients, and caregivers, please wave your hands. Special mention to Madam Tio and Mr. Chiang. who were our first Esther ambassadors, and not forgetting the esteemed leaders of our partner agencies. Thank you once again for being part of this journey with us. In keeping with the spirit of person-centered approach, which is to always start from Esther stories, we will invite you to watch a video featuring one of our Esther ambassadors, Ms. Tian Moziel, who is also in our audience today. Ms. Tian suffers from end-stage kidney failures and a dialysis patient, but she's also a trained chemist with a PhD under her belt. She's a strong advocate for co-production of care and contributed to the production of the new Esther Coach training video. Let's watch it together. Esther Cafe for giving this opportunity to be here, to share my thoughts and experiences. Um, uh, Esther Cafe, if we need to say, they are uh, really doing a wonderful contributions to the society, especially the patient's community and the medical system. They impart in many wonderful manner, especially uh, the patient-centered care, uh, centered care, patient -centered care, and patient's empowerment and care. Like the empowerment I mean here is give the self-development to the patient so that they can handle situations where they are uh, facing a very challenging conditions. And co-production. They are wonderful in the last point, the co-production, is that they don't want to waste the patient potential as a resource in the process of healing and treatment. So that's a great motto. So these three uh, motto drive them really very successful and uh, the results are amazing. Uh, many, many patients are benefited by, this, by their efforts as uh, Esther coaches and the patients called us Esther's, so it's a Esther uh, production. And also, as a whole, their motto is achieved uh, in, uh, we are observing the changes in the uh, industry, that is the medical system have been uh, organized to personally go to the patients and support within these three motto, like patient-centered care and patient empowerment and co-production, and making changes in the industry uh, that is very appreciable and uh, personally i have seen um, making real impact in the lives of patients and i, I would uh, definitely commit in the more coming more years or so uh, and involve myself in all possible ways to support them and make them successful thank you i'd like to invite miss ten to stand Please join me to give a round of applause for Ms. Ten, our dedicated Esther ambassador and experienced expert. Yeah, yeah Ms. Ten is here. Oh, she's in front. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, we would like to invite Prof. Lee Chenan, Deputy Group CEO, Regional Health System, to deliver his welcome address. Prof. Lee, please. A very good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the launch of the Sing Health Duke NUS Center for Person-Centered Care, or what we lovely called CPCC for short, which seeks to promote person-centered philosophy and practices. I would like to thank our colleagues, community partners, patients, residents, and caregivers who have joined us today. In particular, I'd like to give a shout out to our Esther coaches, Esther reps, uh, reps from SPAN, who uh, have taken their time off their busy schedule to be with us. And... Uh, uh, I think uh, one of the Esther coaches was just sharing with me. She was in the initial batch 
uh, which started in 2015. So we are very honoured that uh, you can come and join us uh, today uh, and has seen us uh, through the years. I think we, we should give long service awards to all this. You know, very few people have faithfully contributed and are still actively contributing. Avoid. So uh, today I would like to introduce a term that may be new to some of us, uh, which are which is experienced experts. You know, because our patients and caregivers know their challenges and not just their challenges, but also their aspirations. Right? What they want to achieve in terms of their health, what they want to achieve in terms of their life, and this makes them experts in their own health journey. And being person centered means moving from programs to engaging our patients holistically, focusing not just on their physical and mental well-being, but also taking into account their social and their physical environment. To do this well and in a meaningful way, we need to involve our experienced experts whenever we design care interventions. I was just reading an article yesterday and it says to a, a caregiver or patient, what does it mean to be person-centered? And it said, what, what it means is uh, to welcome questions and uh, to accept them as an informed advocate and also to co-create and co-design together. So I thought that was a very good summary of uh, what, is it, what it means uh, to, in a sense, trying to understand and put our sh sh walk in the shoes of our patients and their caregivers. And the voice of experienced experts is critical in our efforts to achieve a healthier SG where we seek to keep our residents in good health as long as possible. We need to understand what motivates our residents and how we can best partner them and enable them. We also need to strengthen our partnerships with community activators in the health and social sectors to create a conducive ecosystem enabled for healthy living. The Sing Health Centre for Person-Centred Care is privileged to build on the strong foundations of ongoing person-centered initiatives in Sing Health, such as the Esther Network and the Sing Health Patient Advocacy Network, social prescribing, and the various support groups for our patients and caregivers. There is no single magic tool for the success of the CPCC. Instead, we recognize that we need to listen and learn from each other and co-create solutions together. The CPCC aims to be a strategic advocate for those we serve, connect, and build a strong ecosystem of person-centered efforts and be the nexus that drives and coordinates person-centered initiatives in Sing Health with our community partners, patients, and residents. Today and subsequently in the program, I think we will be sharing more on how CPCC will co-create these strategies with you. So in closing, I would like to congratulate the new cohort of Esther coaches on your graduation. I trust that you will make a great impact on our residents' and patients' lives as you continue to champion person-centered care in your respective roles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof Lee. I would now like to invite Prof Ivy Ng, Group CEO, Sing Health, to deliver her opening address to chart the direction for the opening of the center. Prof Ivy, please. Thank you, Afternoon, everyone. You know, and a special, special welcome to our patients, their loved ones, their families, uh, patient advocates, uh, and all fellow colleagues uh, who are with us today. You know, I'm just uh, so delighted to be here uh, at this launch. I think it's a signature event. And, you know, I know this auditorium is filled with champions for person-centered care. Um, you know, it, it seems like yesterday, but I was just saying to uh, our Esther, as in Esther Lim, I know a lot of people here are called Esthers, uh, but <laughs> Esther, I said, when did we go to Yongshoping, you know, in Sweden? And that was when we were first introduced uh, to the Esther Network, right? And that's why it's called Esther, uh, because they built a system, a network of care around a single patient, the first one was called Esther. So they called, they named it after their patient, right, Esther. And, uh, and it, it follows all the principles of moving. It's a major paradigm shift, right? 
from a very paternalistic healthcare system, and I know a lot of my healthcare colleagues are here, you know, we always think we know best what's good for the patient. And that's how we were trained. You know, we learn so many things and then we see our patients and we say, okay, I know what's best for you. You know, so kind of, what's the matter with you? You tell me and then I tell you what we can do to help you. That was how medicine's delivered. That's how healthcare is uh, given out. And the Esther Network, turned it around to saying to a patient what matters to you, right? And then working the system to try and help this whole healthcare system wrap around the patient so that the patient uh, achieves what they want to achieve. And so I want to say that, you know, when we came back, that was 2014, uh, we launched the Esther Network in Sing Health in 2016. And um, every time I do a uh, staff orientation speech and I meet all our new employees, uh, I always say to them, almost the first thing I say to them is Sing Health exists for our patients, you know. That's why we exist. That's why we come to work, you know, every day doing the different things we do because patients come to us and entrust their care to us. And therefore, everything we do, whatever job we do within the, the large healthcare system, we must work seamlessly together to put the patient at the heart of all we do. And of course, all, many of you know that's our very compelling staff tagline, right? Patience at the heart of all we do. But I think today we graduate one step higher, you know, uh, in that we organize the Esther network that we've become familiar with and that has enjoyed, you know, uh, some a success and maturity and what a beautiful sharing from 10. Thank you so much. I love that sharing. To see that what we are doing in Esther Network really does benefit people, the people who come to us, the people that matter, and that's our patients. And now we're going to the next level. The next level is organizing our care in a in a more focused way as we launch the Center for Person-Centered Care, right? So there are two slides, you know, that uh, the organizers want me to share with you. And so pay attention to these two slides. But this effectively is what it's about, you know? It's about patients, caregivers, residents. You're the expert. It's no longer, you know, the doctors, the nurses, the allied health professionals, the administrators. We're not the experts anymore. We come to you with knowledge and some training, but you're the experts. You're the experts in your life, and you're the experts who will help us to craft care that's meaningful and that is what you hope to achieve uh, as you go through this period uh, of your life. So this center is going to be a nexus for all the person-centered initiatives in Sing Health. We want to bring all the people together, hear your experiences, learn from you, and work towards person-centered care to achieve service excellence. So there are six components. You can see there, user experience. Because frankly, you know, if I'm a, a kidney specialist, I can tell you about dialysis, but you can tell me what it's like to actually go for dialysis, how it affects your life, you know, what's the, the good parts about it, what's the bad parts, how can we make it better for you? So we need to shadow you, you know, help you 
um, share with us your experience. And your experience then is the basis for change. Education is critical that all of us are educated together. To put this as a priority, we're all from different domains, different specialties, different institutions, uh, but we want to focus on this and learn more about this area together. We're all innovators, not just the healthcare professionals, but most certainly we must work with each one of you, the users, the patients, the families, because you know what works for you. There was an example, you know, of using a conveyor belt to help a patient who has paralysis of the lower limbs. And then we think about, can the patient use the conveyor belt in their home? Well, no, they can't because the toilet's so much smaller than a hospital toilet. You know, uh, the space to create a conveyor belt is not there. So we need to work with you for solutions and innovations that work in your context. And then research is critical. Um, you know, we launched our Center for Healthcare Research and Implementation, and Yan Ling is here, uh, and he will say how important research is. Because even as we try new things, we almost, always must question ourselves, is it working? Is this good enough? Can we change it? Should we do it a different way? And research makes us ask those questions and answer those questions and plot our direction in the future based on those answers so that we constantly can get better and better document and spread knowledge. And then we have to translate all this to care so that it impacts our day-to-day -day care uh, for our patients and our patients care for themselves. And finally, strategic partnerships, both global and regional, are critical for us so that we can share best practices, we can increase this focus, make it not just a paradigm shift in Sing Health, but throughout that this is the new way of taking care of patients, of delivering healthcare, of improving health of the population. There are various streams. I talked about the Esther Network. I do want to say, you know, we are so happy to be working with the Sing Health Patient Advocacy Network, SPAN members and leaders. Thank you for joining us. You know, you help co-create this whole system, this whole new way of looking things at things. And you are the patient advocates that we need to be part of the leadership team that shapes healthcare for the future. Uh, there's social prescribing. We need local area coordinators and all care coordinators. Um, and having this healthcare training communication for all Sing Health institutions. This slide just says it's everybody who's involved in this. Okay, so if you all think you came to the launch of the Center for Person-Centered Care under our regional health system, and if I'm in SNEC, SGH, you know, I'm just going down the line now, all the leaders, huh? let me just call out. Huh? If you thought you were here to support RHS, you're not, you're part of it, okay? So it takes all of us, really all of us working together to bring about this paradigm shift that, you know, I know will benefit uh, not just the present uh, generation of colleagues that we have, but also uh, the future and most importantly, our patients, the residents, and population that's been assigned to us to help them, uh, we need to use this new lens as we plan the care and deliver the care uh, to them. And so, you know, let me 
uh, end here by congratulating the Esther graduates, right? We're also here to celebrate them. So I wonder if they can stand uh, and we all can clap hands for them, right? You're the champions. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you're the champions and you lead the way. You join the community of Esther champions. You join the community of Esthers uh, to lead the way as we formalize and expand this whole approach of person-centered care. So with that, you know, let me um, congratulate all the teams who have been involved in Putting this together, you know, uh, Esther Lim, whom you will hear from shortly, uh, Chenan, Lian Ling, you know, all of them worked very hard on many papers uh, that had to be presented and that had to come up uh, for this new center to be launched. And so I want to congratulate you and actually congratulate all of us as we co create this new way of delivering care to benefit all our patients and residents. Thanks very much. Thank you, Prof. Ivy. To celebrate and officiate the launch of the Sing Health Center for Person-Centered Care, we have prepared a cake for this special occasion. We'd like to invite Prof. Ivy, Prof. Lee, Ms. Esther Lim, and Ms. Violet Tra to join us on stage for the cake cutting ceremony. Some of you might be asking, why a cake instead of a usual ribbon cutting ceremony? Well, this is a meaningful tradition that we have learned from our Sweden Esther Network partners to not only focus on the task at hand, but to make every effort to celebrate each other achievements and milestones. As you can see on the screen, the design of the cake is adorned with hearts created by thumbprints. It represents a notion of co-production where individual works together in partnership. This is how we hope to build our CPCC ecosystem. A round of applause as our guests cut the celebratory cake. <laughs> Thank you, guests. <laughs> Kindly return to your seats. <laughs> For our audience, please remember to collect a slice of this delicious, hopefully healthy cake at the main entrances after the event. Okay. We're now privileged to hear from Ms. Violet Chua, Esther Ambassador and Experience Expert. Ms. Violet used to work in the corporate field and plays the role of a caregiver to many, including her parents and sister who have been diagnosed with dementia. Today, however, she'll be sharing with us her personal experience as a care recipient. Uh, let us in now invite Ms. Violet Chua on stage. Ms. Violet, please. Is it Hello, good afternoon. My name is Violet Chua. Up until not too long ago, I was running on the a hectonic treadmill, corporate treadmill, endlessly chasing after corporate success. I was very nonchalant about my health, medically ignorant, because I thought I was a superwoman. Alas, one day, one fine day, divine intervention took place and put a pause on my life through a series of medical episodes in succession and directed me on the path to experience firsthand the services of Sing Health Hospital Care. Uh, prior to that, I was just coming into SGH for this very transactional medical appointments. So one day I was working in Seoul uh, on a Friday morning, and suddenly I could not see the laptop screen. All the characters and everything was crooked. I looked up, looked at the, my colleagues' faces. They were all out of shape. I looked at the doorpost. It was all crooked. So instinctively, I felt something was wrong with my vision. I looked up the SNEC hotline telephone number. I called that number. Uh, telephone operator picked up. 
She listened intently as I described my symptoms to her. Uh, then she said, okay, you come in on Monday morning, 9 a.m., which is a surprise. Sorry to say this, but SNEC has a notorious reputation of not able, <laughs> of not able to give you an earlier appointment. Okay, sorry if you're from SNEC. <laughs> we have to beg if it's urgent. So, but the telephone operator, thanks to the telephone operator, you see today, she helped me restore my vision. When I showed up on, at SNEC Monday morning, the ophthalmologist told me you have detached retina. Medically ignorant, don't know, right? What's that, <laughs> you know, and what does it mean? Okay, upon discharge, uh, sorry, after two days of the discharge, however, I had to run back to the A&E &E again. What happened? I suddenly saw like black raindrops in my eye. Scary. So went back and then what they explained to me was, you know, you are familiar, you're given this black horseshoe pillow thing. You're supposed to sleep on your stomach, you know, with the thing with, on your head. But I must have pressed my eye apparently on the pillow. Uh, the discharge instructions could have been clearer that I'm only supposed to press only the forehead, you know. <laughs> Ignorant, right? So... Another time after a wonderful Royal Caribbean cruise, disembarked, feeling sick, high fever and bloated stomach and all that, was hospitalized again for a week, 39 degrees fever. But during this episode, I witnessed how harried and overworked nurses were. Uh, the nurse who attended to me was dashing from patient to patient. Poor nurse, her uniform was dirty. I think she didn't have a chance to change out of it. And when I asked her, have you had your lunch at one o'clock? She said, not yet. I was tempted to offer her my tray of food where I couldn't eat, right? Uh, but I know it's against protocol. Uh, but I want to salute all the nurses and the frontline healthcare workers. They are so, so dedicated. I cannot do that, you know. Now, uh, the third episode, I can only have time to talk about salient episodes. Uh, one day, I felt... I missed a step in the dimly lit car park, right? Broke both bones. I had two operations on my leg and uh, ended up again. <laughs> These were three things in a row. Think, things come in sets of three, right? So, but I must uh, be very, I, I'm very thankful for the orthopedic surgeon who attended to me. You know, you know, I, I had a work crisis and you are, you're, you're, you know, you're not thinking logically and all that kind of stuff. So he was so calm and composed. It helped me a lot as a patient. Okay. Because, uh, you know, all sorts of thoughts of, oh my God, I'm a type A personality type, you know, running around the world and all that. You know, can I, will I be able to walk again? Will I be able to function as I had before? The kind of stuff? But he was really good. Then come a day, happiness. Remove the, the uh, clips. Okay, you are familiar with this. Huh? My past experiences of removing the stitches very easy, right? The nurse just cut the thread, no sweat. So happily came into the clinic, you know, chatting with the nurses, you know, they lie down, two nurses attending to me. The first click that went, I went, ouch, I scream very loud. What's that? What did you do? You know, you know, they're just put, yanking out the clips. So it was. Uh, really traumatic. So I was arguing with them, you know, in pain, but still can argue. Why, why can't you apply some LA or numbing cream on my leg, you know? Five nurses around me, two patting my back. Keep calm, take a deep breath, think of something nice. Like what? Uh, take us. Take a, like imagine you are taking a stroll along the beach, watching sunset. I'm not a sun and sita person. I'm a modern and good person. I still can argue. But ouch! You know, I was screaming very embarrassingly. When I, I, I'm glad we was COVID time wearing masks. Huh? When you walk out, while all the patients staring at me. Very embarrassed. But on hindsight, uh, I felt that they could have explained to me. It was only a lot later on. Then I had an answer from a doctor to say that, oh, they probably cannot uh, apply because the wounds were still raw and fresh and where there would be a blood oozing out. So they could not uh, inject or whatever. 
to apply to the wounds. But it was a very tra traumatic uh, memory for me up to today. I'm very scared. Uh, and there are 30 clips, you know. I know it's, for nurses, it's part of the course. Uh, you are very familiar. Are, it's like your daily job. I just take up stitches. Uh. But this one very painful, you know. <laughs> Imagine, you know. Okay. Um, maybe before I summarize one of the lessons that take away, one, let me share one tip. I think just now, uh, Professor Ng mentioned about innovations. Huh? Because when we reach home, another stress point, wheelchair cannot go in and out of the flat. A lot of flats are not elder-friendly, right? COVID cannot have contractor come to the house. My brother-in-law had this brilliant idea. Go HDB shop, buy the washing board. <laughs> You know, this I think y'all don't use really now. People use washing machine, right? Just use masking tape, tape it, voila, you have a wheelchair ramp. <laughs> so I just share this DIY tip. Cheap and good. One bought only $7.50. <laughs> right? No, no need to spend a few hundred dollars to build a ramp. No time also. No time also. And if it's not high enough, just put some plastic from be below, raise it up. Okay. So sometimes when you're forced in a situation to think of simple solution. Okay, if I may summarize the key takeaway. Number one, is a torture uh, to be hospitalized, okay? Uh, especially like for me, I'm a type A personality type. You ask me to lie in bed, to, oh my God, cannot sleep, you know? And you cannot sleep day and night, right? A lot of inter nurses have to do their jobs to check your vitals and all that, and you know, the interruption from other patients. And I, I accept and understand not all patients are the same. Uh, but to me, uh, healthcare, excellent healthcare is not just about having a competent doctor. I think it's a whole spectrum of all the healthcare professionals at different touch points, like the SNEC telephone operator. I'm eternally grateful for, to her for saving myself. I think she's experienced enough to recognize that this patient needs an immediate appointment. And also for the ambulance paramedic when I was being transported here when I broke my leg, I think she was asking me a number of questions, but I cannot really hear her. I think I was in pain and I was uh, you know, sweating profusely. She sounded very, she was asking me questions, but she sounded very far away. But I think she was experienced and trained enough to put an oxygen mask on me. Immediately, I felt a lot better and I could respond to her questions more coherently. You know? So, and the most important thing for me, a uh, key dimension is the trust between not just the doctor and the medical staff as well. Uh, I know a lot of friends that say, you cannot trust this doctor opinion or better go on six-second opinion. Go and pay, don't know how many thousand dollars get private doctor uh, opinion, okay? So I think patient segmentation is probably important, you know, to, to tailor a patient-centric uh, care uh, system. The thing that I'd also like to share is, a lot, uh, whilst I said I don't like to be hospitalized, Okay, because what is one of the biggest torture? You do all your toileting on the bed. Sorry, brush your teeth, wash your face, everything do on the bed. I now ask the nurse how. Uh? <laughs> I say, if I cannot go to the toilet, can you come bring the toilet to me? You know, now I understand patient safety is of paramount importance, infection, risk falls, and all that. But I think it also triggers another set of problems. Imagine staying five days on the bed, cannot do toileting. You know, it's torture. So I, the other thing about no, no confidence being dis, uh, of being discharged, for example, with my broken leg, on the morning of the discharge, the physiotherapist came and give you a walker and then, oh, you're supposed to just hop on this leg. <laughs> Say, how? I cannot. I don't know how to do. So I got arguing with him and I was then, uh, I think he consulted with the doctor. I was transferred to Otram Community Center for another day to have more practice. Communication is also very important, like with the removal of the clips. If the nurses are explained to me the situation, uh, it helps me mentally and emotionally to prepare for the pain. I think that, was, that would have been helpful. You know? uh, health body is an excellent tool. I think it's really, really good. Uh, but I would like to request if there's some improvement, like for example, when we have appointments, reminder, have you done your... Uh, Please ensure you've done your blood test or x-ray, you know, uh, before you come for the doctor's appointment. And I love this remote care and monitoring uh, thing uh, because touch wood, hope I won't use it, but, uh, you know, you will also cut down the hospitalization experiences. 
Lastly, in conclusion, thank you for allowing me to share uh, my experiences. I want to take this opportunity to wish Sing Health a resounding success in embracing this Esther philosophy of person-centered care so that you will achieve you know, an elevated standard of uh, uh, healthcare uh, service and you become an exemplary institution, not only in Singapore, but in Asia and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Violet, uh, for sharing the, your incredible story with us. Please remain on stage as we move into our next segment where we will be having a panel discussion on person-centered care. This afternoon, we are honored to invite a panel of distinguished speakers to have a dialogue on what person-centered care is and discuss how we can work together to co-produce care in the 21st century. Audience can participate in this conversation by using Pigeon Whole Life to post your questions. You can scan the QR code shown on the screen or use your smartphone to launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Next, key in, into our, key in our event password, which is CPCC. Responses to unanswered questions from the Pigeon Hole will be sent via email after the event. Now, please join me to welcome our panelists on stage, Ms. Violet Chua, Prof. Lee Chien En, Ms. Esther Lim, Director CPCC, Ms. Chang Suk Mei, Director Group Office of Patient Experience, Ms. Stephanie Teo, Director Community Nursing, and Dr. Luke Lo, Senior Consultant, will be our moderator for this segment. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Luke. I work in Sing Health Community Hospitals. Uh, but I thought before we start uh, the panel, I wanted to just run through an asset map that shows the good work that um, we have been doing as a whole of Sing Health. Yeah, so, Esther Network, together with SPAN, has percolated throughout the whole of Sing Health. And through it, we use it to guide us in uh, many of the activities in our various institutions. Even though you only see six hospitals and institutions here, it does not mean that the rest are not doing. The rest are in the progress and in the process of starting their own person-centered care initiatives and programs. And I hope that one day, we no longer just see listings of hospitals, institutions, and programs, but that we'll be uh, We'll be happy to say that the whole of Sing Health embodies and embraces person-centered care as our main guiding principle, where we partner patients at the heart of all we do, and we come together to co-create the care plan that really matters to our patients. Yeah, so with that, um, um, it brings me to start the panel discussion. And if I may just uh, bring up the screen for the pigeonhole. Okay, wow. So, so there is a question that seems to be racing ahead. Nine votes. Okay. How can we balance the time and effort required for person-centered care, uh, given our already heavy workload and patient numbers? I'd like to invite uh, anyone from our panel to take this question. I think as a patient, I can understand, like I said, I witnessed how nurses had worked, uh, you know, in the ward, you know, from my bed, like I said, uh, I, I can observe. I can also accept the fact that patient safety is the number one priority. Uh, I think in terms of, I think prioritization would be a key by Sing Health. What is most important at each level <laughs> Uh, at each component, you know, the of of the work process. So, when that work prioritization is clear, then how do you? In, for me, maybe because I come, I came from the corporate world. I think the training uh, to install the mindset change that it comes so naturally in what you do every day uh, would be very helpful.
So as a staff of the Office of Patient Experience, we often have to balance between what our colleagues tell us and what our patients are telling us. One of the aspects of care that patients tell us they appreciate most is the undivided attention and the patience of the staff taking care of them. However, this takes time, right? And we know that uh, it takes effort. However, if you front load some of this effort, I believe that it can preempt a lot of potential problems by having to answer complaint replies. Okay, but having said that, I would say that um, in patient experience, we've, we've now gotten a lot more uh, feedback from the digital formats using the online surveys and the qualitative comments are very helpful. So uh, at the institutions, you can work with your Office of Patient Experience to see what are some of the top line trends and also address some of the things that patients appreciate and work on those um, as an appreciative inquiry rather than always hmm, dwelling on complaints, which is uh, less pleasant. Yeah. So I think in if we were to unpack uh, person-centered care, uh, what, what, what does it actually mean? I think from, because I think all of us have been on uh, those working in healthcare, we have been also on the other side where we have been patients too, uh, or whether as a caregiver or bringing our loved ones. And I do notice that, you know, firstly is at the consult or the session itself, do our patients feel respected? Do our patients feel listened to? I think as uh, what Violet as uh, Sukmi have said. And I think this carries a lot of it with how the words that we say, our body language and our attentiveness. I think we have all come away from experiences where we have sat through sessions that took 15 minutes or 20 minutes and we feel that it's both are on different frequency. Right? And although a lot of time has been spent, we come out very dissatisfied. But there have also been sessions where sometimes you are there just five, six minutes, but you feel good when you come out. You know? And that experience is not limited to healthcare. It can be the experience when you get stuck with someone in the lift. You know, the lift is just going from first floor to whatever floor and you just have that few minutes. But the way someone conducts themselves, their demeanor, their attentiveness, you feel special, you know, that hey, this person actually listened and what, and then I can continue the conversation that is not the end, but if I have any queries, I don't feel bad and it doesn't make me feel, you know, stupid to ask these questions, but I feel respected. So I thought, yes, we have time constraints, but also as well, says, how do we prioritize and how do we carry ourselves and conduct ourselves through this? The other area is, of course, we also have to look through the processes as to how uh, the work that we do. And as we say, some of it could be front-loaded. And the other aspect is also working as a team. right? Because while each member may not be able to do everything, and of, often we can't, how can a team support each other to do it? And when I say a team is a real team where we complement each other, rather than a transactional team where it's in team in name, but every time you go, the information doesn't get shared. It is not building on each other, but instead it is duplicating or replicating what's the work. You know, like when we were, you feel that what, this person asked me the same question, another person asked me the same question. So it's actually same work times three, but it doesn't add that much value to it. But if we really work as a team, then how do we complement each other? So, so I, I don't think there's a simple answer for this, but I'm just thinking that within our current constraints, there are things that we can do, uh, like the process review, front-loading. The other things is the, the dynamics, working as a team, and also in our individual encounters. Uh, how, how can we actually convey that part that our patients or their caregivers feel that they are part of the team that is actually caring for them. Thanks. Thank you, Violet, uh, Sokmei, and Prof Lee for stating the uh, patient's experience perspective, as well as from the uh, Office of Patient Experience and the care providers in having that need to balance out not one or the other.
but as Sing Health embarks on this transformative journey uh, to be able to walk that thin line that provides good patient experience while also delivering optimal care for our patients. Yeah. Uh, as a moderator, my duty is also to make sure that we also go through the other questions. Uh, so looking at the next one, uh, we have one for uh, six votes. Uh, if client rejects any assistance or intervention despite healthcare professionals or case managers' advice, what are some things that can be done in view of uh, person-centered care? Uh, Esther, I, oh, yes, Stephanie, you want to take it? Okay. Stephanie, you want, you want to go first? I'll go first, thank you. So, so when we talk about person-centered care, so the first question is what matters to the patient, right? And um, if the client were to reject the assistance or intervention, usually there's some underlying issues or, or the patient's expressed needs has not been heard yet. So I think it is good for the healthcare providers to understand the patient more and also to find out what motivates the patient and also to solve the underlying uh, immediate issues before we propose that this should be the care that the patient or the person should accept. And hence, this co-designing care plans, uh, uh, co-creating or co-producting, co-production of the care is very important so that uh, we will continue to embrace the practice of person-centered care and at the same time help the patient to resolve uh, the, the, the so-called the needs that troubles the patient. Yeah, just want to add to Stephanie's point. Um, so, so as a trained social worker, uh, many of our clients come to us uh, often, you know, uh, quite adamant, you know, to whatever the doctors say, you know, or the nurses tell them. And uh, the, the real key is really connecting. Um, because if you talk about, uh, you know, some of the examples raised were holding, you know, what if this patient just want to live in a holding environment that is very unhealthy, unsafe? Um, it's really about understanding, as Stephanie said, you know, and connecting. And then you have the ability to influence a possible change. Uh, because the truth is, if we just prescribe solutions or send HDB down and move away all the hoarded stuff, uh, you will go home to sleep. The next morning you wake up, you know, it'll be full of stuff again because you'll be up to bring in things. So it's really about, you know, connection um, and understanding why. Um, and and then you will be able to influence them. So so I think it's probably you know not easy to wrap our head around, but it's truly is a standard practice that we must you know resolve uh, to to do to do this. Yeah, and, and I think that when someone says no, as uh, Stephanie and uh, Esther has said, is understanding why did they say no? Is it uh no forever? Or is it also a time-limited no? That means not yet. You know, so, you know, so, sometimes if you're trying to catch someone who's rushing to the toilet, right? You want to talk to them. Say, no. Does it mean I don't want to talk to you at all forever? Or is what? Because there's something more urgent that they need to do. And it's like, right? So, just uh, the example there, right? So, it is... Uh, and also... Understanding the why, uh, just an example, uh, because we have a community nurse post which was situated in a social service organization, and initially when it started, it was a it was co-located, but the services were provided, uh, you know, separately, and when we tried to engage uh, the people who come and ask them, would you like to go for health screening? What about your health and all those things, the that came were not very receptive. I think uh, Cheryl, who uh, was at the center, can actually share more from our neighbor's team. Uh, so we, when we understood is that when people go to the SSOs, they are actually going there because they are concerned with their finances. Do I have money to eat? My children's education. And then you ask me go for health screening and all those things. You know? So no problem, don't look for a problem, right? And then find other things. But we also recognize that if their health issues are not settled, getting employment, caring for it does have the effect. But for the person who come, the client, that is not their priority at the moment. So what was done was then the SSO and the community nurse post then worked together and did what we call joint interviewing. 
so that when the client come, it is both the nurse or in this case, it need not even be the nurse, it's our neighbours, which is uh, a, like a well-being coordinator, as well as the social worker talking to the resident, the client together. And over time, building the trust, building the relationship and the client understanding that, oh, this is about holistic care, right? This is that what I'm worried about, my finances, my health, my all those things, the health has an impact on it. And the SSO will help me with this part. The CMP will help me with this part, but it is done together. And I would say that over time, this has improved the take-up rate and, and the, you know, the acceptance of the services of uh, in the in the post itself. So, so I think this is one example for us to also think through uh, that if we better understand why someone says no, it can also help. But at the end of the day, there may be some who adamantly said no. And I think as part of the respecting, unless it involves their personal safety or, or, or whatever, or the safety of others, I think we have to respect that. But we leave the door open that, you know, that if they change their mind, they will not be made to look, you know, it's like, hey, see, I told you, you come back. Right? But it's, it's a welcoming back that, okay, if you change your mind, you, uh, we, we will work with you, we will still. So that, you know, I think the key is that people feel respected for their decision and the dignity of, of it like, because there may be some reasons. And sometimes, uh, even though I said we ask why, uh, sometimes as a patient or caregiver, we can't uh, say articulate why actually. I've been in that shoe before. My gut feel is say no. But I, actually, you ask me why, I cannot think through why. But it's go back after I rationalize, I think through it. Then it's like, oh, actually, why not? Why did I say that? No, so, so these are from the perspective of a user of the service. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Stephanie, Esther, and Prof. Lee. Yeah, it is true. Uh, when patients reject us, uh, no matter what it is, we can still offer them basic respect, care, and compassion. And, and we can then see how we can push the relationship even further. Um, since we are on the topic of um, community nurse posts, I see a question that's coming up on community nursing, which I thought I can probably pass to Stephanie to start first. Uh, what are community nursing's plans to push for person-centered care in the community? And uh, how do you intend to achieve this? Actually, person-centered care is a practice. It is a concept that our community nurses or nurses in the primary care has been embracing all this well. It's just that we do not label it as person-centered care. So I give you an example. If my community nurses were to engage the patient for the first time, they will go through a very comprehensive assessment that covers the psychosocial aspect, the clinical aspect, the medical aspects, and so on. And from there, they will see what are the needs of the patient, the expressed needs, and what other issues that uh, the commoners will need to help them to link to the social partners and, and all that. And then to uh, utilize um, motivational interviewing techniques and to help the patient to come up with a care plan. So, so actually, person-centered care is something that's already happening. Uh, however, we, we feel that it is it's still important to continue to push this concept, this approach, so that more and more nurses will practice that and more and more of our patients Will, uh, will, will be able to receive that kind of care that is best for them. And uh, I think to name one of the uh, uh, so-called uh, event that will be coming out is that uh, SGH actually has the Nursing Person-Centered uh, Care Council. And uh, they are going to run a, uh, a so-called campaign uh, to uh, talk about person-centered care and, and to motivate more care providers, uh, so, so-called healthcare providers uh, on the concept, what are the core principles about what this person-centered care are. So just look out for it. Thank you. If I may uh, sell Koyo a bit for our Healthier SG team. Okay, because with the uh, rollout of the Healthier SG uh, initiative by MOH, uh, at Sing Health, we are setting up what we call the Healthier SG team, which are what we call place-based team. These are teams that are uh, embedded within particular localities, right? The reason why we feel that there's a need for this is because 
uh, each zone that our residents stay in have some unique features, right? The, where, uh, how the physical layout is, what are the community support that is available, uh, what types of lodging, some, some may have more rental flats, some may be private estates, some may have younger population, some older population. Uh, it, although Singapore is small, uh, there are differences in different parts of Singapore. I think we are all aware of it. And therefore, we need to provide care that is appropriate to that particular context. And we feel that by having this place-based team, they would, within uh, the broad framework, they have the autonomy to customize the care that they deliver to the residents or the clients as is this needed. And in this Healthier SG team, there are actually four modules. One is the primary care provider. Two is the community nurse. Third is the community partner. And fourth is the well-being coordinator that helps to coordinate the work. And all four need not be sing health staff. The, com the primary care provider can be a GP. The community nurse can be from one of partners, Home Nursing Foundation uh, or some other uh, no, NGOs, nurses. Of course, community partners are our partners. Wellbeing coordinators could be from AIC. But important, as I mentioned earlier, is that we work as a team so that we can meet the needs of our clients or our residents holistically. And depending on the client's needs, then each person will come in and provide it. And the unique thing about working in a community is that we are all, in a particular sense, generalists. So, in the community, I think we also want to avoid a situation whereby, uh, you know, we have four or five people keep knocking on the patient's door to provide. Today, I come and treat the wound. Tomorrow, someone come and help you exercise a bit. Another day, someone come in and change a tube because it, it can get quite disruptive. Uh, so what we are also trying to see, how can we cross-train our people, right? Because some of the... For example, even if you're a nurse, it may be possible that some of the simpler exercises that it could be taught also, you don't need to call for a therapist because in the hospital, if you call a therapist, it may be the therapist may be one floor down. But in the community, call for therapist is uh, quite far away and then you have to make the appointment and all those things. So, and then if uh, the other day I was meeting up with some social workers which uh, Esther organized and that was the same question that were asked. No, if we notice that the patient is today a bit groggy, uh, at home, I would have taken the blood sugar. Or I would have taken the blood pressure. But because I'm not a doctor, but when I do home visit, I cannot do. Huh? Why cannot take the sugar and all those? Instead, I have to tell them, uh, go and see doctor, go and see this and those kind of things. So, we, we wondering, yeah, are these a law that say cannot do or is it our own uh, no, practices that or our mental models that limit us from doing it when we have been doing it for our parents or sometimes ourselves. So these are things that I think we have to rethink as to uh, what is it that is uh, good for our patients and what is it that we can do in terms of making it more convenient and make care more accessible and in fact reduce our own workload also. Yeah, Thank you, Stephanie and Prof Lee. Uh, so we really know that uh, community nursing is a still relatively new concept that we have learned from Yong Shu Ping as well as a few other countries. But I have to say they have made a lot of headway in this area and Sing Health is leading in this area as well. Yeah. Uh, we only have time for one more question, unfortunately. And looking at um, the list, I thought we could probably take a question on digitization. Because uh, before we started, I was just chatting with Violet, uh, comparing banks versus hospitals, how we are always a little bit one step behind the digitization journey. But nonetheless, we are on the way there. Yeah, so uh, this question, as we move towards digitization, how can we leverage on the use of Health Buddy and other patient-fronting apps for person-centered care? Maybe before I talk about digitization, I've witnessed how transformation had worked. Uh, take, for example, you're familiar with DBS Bank. For those old, of you old enough to remember, when DBS took over POSB, the service was terrible, very slow, such that 
uh, people joke that DBS bank stands for damn bloody slow bank. You know? But look at what DBS is today. They identified 250 work processes. They applied the layer of digitization on it. They are the one of the leading banks of Asia Pacific now. Similarly for OCBC, try getting a loan from them 10 years ago. You know their tagline is solid as a rock, right? You, they, and you, you try and get a loan from them, you, is, they make you feel like you're scamming them, take money from them, when you, actually you're giving them business. But they also went through a lot of trans and the, the joke they earned from themselves, the moniker, OCBC, OCBC stands for only can borrow coins. And, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's true. The, we are so frustrated. Uh, I, I work in the IT industry for 24 years, uh, dealing with a number of clients. And I witnessed how transformation really, really improved the productivity of an organization. But I know it's not easy. Huh? It takes the collective willpower of the entire organization to make it happen. So as a proud Singaporean, I'm happy to see that we have this Esther Person Center Care as one of the initiative to move the uh, health service up the next level. Uh, and I think we have no choice given the population demographics change. The next layer of seniors is probably going to be like worse than me, even though I question. I was just sharing with uh, somebody when I was on the ward, when the nurse came to give the auntie an injection, auntie patsama. Ah, okay. And just, she just rolled over and let the nurse. But when my turn came, why are you injecting in me? What is it? You know, I will ask a lot of questions. So I think with the demographic change, I think there's no choice. We have to move forward. Yeah, thank you, Violet. Um, and I, I'm reminded that time is up. Uh, so uh, please accept my apologies if not all the questions have been answered. Please don't hate me when I go off stage. And it remains for me uh, to thank everybody, our esteemed panelists, for the time here. Thank you. Please join us to thank our panelists for their insightful discussion. We would also like to invite Prof Lee to present a token of appreciation to Ms. Violet Tra for graciously sharing her story and participating in the panel discussion. Thank you, panelists. Please take a seat. Thank you. Thank you. This year, we are heartened to celebrate the graduations of 43 Esther Network coaches from the class of 2021. These coaches from various health and community care sectors have put in tremendous efforts to overcome various challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic to complete their improvement project. We are extremely proud of our coaches and would like to recognize the achievements through this next video. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you our graduating Esther coaches, class of 2021. Project title, Accepting Coping Experience, ACE with Parkinson's Disease. Esther coaches, Go Rui Hao, Faith Ng, Amanda Tay, Betty Yap. Project title, Hello Neighbor. Esther Coaches, Mohammad Afif Arifin, Lo Sing Ting, Jenny Ng, Lim Wan Yen. Project title, It Starts From Home. Esther Coaches, Dean Go, Serene Go, Debra Chen. Project title, Be Confident, Be Independent, Improves Physical Performance of Community Dwelling Older Male Adults by 25% Within 3 Months. Esther Coaches, Jovin Ang, Lim Ewen. Project title, Care Project, Creating Awareness to Relieve Esther. Esther Coaches, Yong Xiao Wei, Lim Hui Ru, Hanida Binti A. Raman. Project title, Reducing Application of Body Vest in Managing Esther with Dementia. Esther Coaches, Mariana, daughter of Amanula, Aziza Binti Hasbadi. Project title, My Food Matters, Esther's with Diabetes to Stay and Live Well in the Community.
Master Coaches, Ting Ching Yu, Teofila Lan. Project title, Designing a Resource Platform for Esters. Esther Coaches, Camellia C, Faith Tan. Project title, Mind Your Mind. Esther Coaches, Arya Yo, Lim Yi Wen, Valencia Lim, Tan Le Hong, Ren Fei. Project title, Home Sweet Home, an improved process for discharge of medically complex children. Esther Coaches, Zheng Yan Ying, Hu Shi Ming, Julie Tay. Project title, My Footprints, person-centered care approach to identify and meet the needs of nursing home residents. Esther Coaches, Martin Wong, Shelby Tan, Rachel Cole. Project title, Ready, Steady, Radiotherapy. Increasing preparedness of esters in managing radiation-related oral health side effects after radiotherapy for head and neck cancer. Esther coach, Dr. Chan Tae Yuan. Project title, Improving Chronic Pain Patients' Self-Efficacy in Pain Management and Reduce Emergency Department Visits. Esther coach, Rachel Lee. Project title, 3S, Soft and Smooth Skin to Improve Esther's Skin Moisture Level from 23% to 35% within two months. Esther Coaches, Esther Kerr, Adora De Leon Estipa, Li Yang. Congratulations to Esther Coaches, Class of 2021. We now invite you to come up on stage for a graduation photo. Once again, uh, let us put our hand together to congratulate the class of 2021. <laughs> May we please invite Professor Ivy and Professor Lee to join our graduate coaches on stage to for photo taking. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Esther, Professor Ivy, Professor Lee. Congratulations to our coaches. To end off this afternoon's celebration, we'd like to invite Ms. Esther Lim, Director of CPCC, to deliver the closing address. Esther, please. Hey, thank you, everyone. So, um, yeah, so I just have four quick points uh, to make. So I am Esther Lim, if you wonder who am I. Um, really, you know, uh, I just want to share, you know, a person-centered experience because if you want to run person-centered care, I think we have to reflect on what, you know, has really worked for us. So some of um, my colleagues will know that several years ago, um, you know, my mother had a very serious accident when we were in uh, Tasmania. So she fell from a flight of steps and then her the back of her head hit the floor first. So had, she had this palm size uh, hemorrhage on her brain. Um, and we had to be highly evacuated, you know, via a helicopter uh, from a small town to uh, the main city. Yeah, and it was a very traumatic experience for me. My husband had to drive the kids, you know, in a car and I went with the uh, helicopter. Um, but, you know, I was uh, very impressed, you know, with the 
paramedics come pilots. So they were pilots and paramedics. So one attended to my mom to stabilize her, and the other one put his full attention on me. So he helped, you know, put on my seatbelt, you know, um, gently, and uh, keep engaging me to make sure that as a caregiver, I'm fine too. So when we reached the A&E, you, know, um, you know, they were trying to stabilize my mom in the CCU, the resource uh, unit. Uh, and I was uh, quite frantic and waiting alone. And uh, very surprisingly, the two paramedics, after settling the administrative duties, they circle back to the CCU to look for me. Yeah, just to make sure that I'm settled in properly and to share with me that they really felt very sorry for what has happened. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know if I've mentioned to you that they are both actually very good looking. Um, look like top gun pilots you know so i was also very amazed that in that shop i can still observe that they were pretty good looking <laughs> yeah but on a serious note you know that sense of warmth that they left in my heart lingered for many years because as a paramedic okay you look at back in singapore our scdf huh? can you imagine them doing that you know, circling to the CCU to look for you. Normally, you know, you will be left and then they'll be gone, you know, and you don't even see their face or get their names. So, so that is really a very person-centered experience for me. Um, not to mention that the small town doctor also called me, um, you know, two days later and asked to speak to me via the hospital reception just to check in on how my mom is doing, how am I doing. Yeah, so circling back to Singapore, I think Stephanie, you know, has shared, you know, that our community nurse is really doing pretty similar personalized services as Madam Teo always attests to it. Each time I call her, she will tell me, oh, my com nurse is really doing a wonderful job showing person-centered care. But on the flip side, we all know that there are certain mold that we still need to break. For example, you know, uh, what Prof I shared about this sense of task-orientedness, you know, we are really very task-oriented. Um, in Violet's example, once we realize we can't do something, we can't do a task, we can't give you LA, we can't give you a numbing cream, uh, then we don't want to talk about it. But the truth is, all the more, the patient needs us to talk about it so that they can be prepared emotionally and mentally for what is to come. So that is true person-centered care. Because if we only think about, I will only talk about things I can do, yeah, because that's my profession, then we are not so person-centered. But if we flip ourselves to their position, but the patient needs to know, the patient needs to be prepared for the pain, then we are truly person-centered. Yeah, so, and, um, and, and truly, you know, um, Many of our uh, Esther's, uh, Violet included, our experienced experts, will ask me, you know, so what is going to happen after the launch? Okay, they're also quite task-oriented. So they say, you know, so Esther, after the rara, what's next? You know, tell me what's next. Um, and I would like to share that for any program to succeed, you know, there are actually three levels of players, okay, people. Yeah, so we all know the first layer is the macro system. Yeah, so the setup of this center is already a very good signal um, that there are resources allocated to us um, and we are very serious as a Sing Health um, institution, as a community, you know, we are committed to do this and that is the leader's, you know, commitment. And the third level is the micro system. It's where our patients, our residents, our Esther coaches who work at the patient fronting end come together. So our SPAN network, you know, and uh, also our school who is already educating, you know, community partners coming together doing the work, you know, once it starts, you know, so, so that layer is also ready. Okay, so which is the layer that is probably, uh, that needs more work to be done is the meso system. Okay, so it's the second row and uh, probably third, fourth, fifth row colleagues that we are talking about. Yeah, so we, so we made it a point to invite all our institution CEOs, CMBs, you know, CFOs, you know, CHROs, and uh, also the HODs, yeah, and the uh, prof has also asked to see the main, name list, uh, by the way, just to share with you. Yeah, so we are truly resolved, and I think without this layer of uh, partnership from the leaders, uh, it is hard for us to turn things around, because we do need to perhaps even change measurements um, that measures performance, because when you change measurements that measure your performance, it will drive our behavior in a person-centered way. So we really need to work on the meso system and we need the hand-in-hand -hand collaboration with the line managers and the institution leaders. Um, so lastly, I just want to announce that, um, you know, a uh, few years back, we took some feedback from our com partners, you know, uh, some very core anchor partners, and they've given us feedback that, you know, to be person-centered care, we really need to improve our navigation within the campus. Um, you know, that our patients often get lost, you know, elderly patients, and sometimes they 
came out very early of the house, but then they go home without seeing the doctor because they totally missed the appointment. They can't find the clinic. So I just want to share that at least at the Sing Health uh, at SGH campus level, we have started a medical chaperone service uh, where we engage our staff and our volunteers to actually help our patients navigate their way around so that they don't uh, miss the appointments or get too late an appointment. So we just want to share that although it was a complex problem and it took us several years, but we just want to share that as a Sing Health community, we take your feedback very seriously. Um, and with this attitude you know, and this collaborative partnership, we will work hand in hand with you. And I'm pretty sure that we can together achieve and deliver person-centered care with grit, with resilience, you know, in our time, not in our children's time, but in our time. Okay, and with this, we want to thank you and we'll be working hand in hand with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Esther. Ladies and gentlemen, before we end today's celebration, let us take a group shot. Um, so our photographer will come on stage. Can I have the first three rows on the left and right block to just move into the center seats? This is your attendance taking shot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, can everyone sitting on the side, left and right block, to move to the center block, please? Please don't be shy. Uh, please fill up the seats. <laughs> Can we move your mask just for the photo? Yeah. Let's remove our mask for the photo. Okay, the photographer will kill us. Okay. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you have enjoyed your time with us. Uh, please join me once again as we thank our Esther's ambassadors for being our partners in envisioning and co-creating person-centered care. Our dear Esther's ambassadors, before you exit, uh, please leave by the door on your right because we have a gift for you. Uh, and thank you very much. If you would like to find out more about the Centre or, uh, or for Person-Centered Care and, and would like to involve, please write us to us through the email shown on the screen. Once again, thank you and wishing you a wonderful afternoon ahead. Please remember to collect a slice of the cake at the exit.